Hi, everybody, as you're coming in. Interesting to watch the numbers go up on participants. It was eight a few minutes ago, 26, and up it goes. And that's just computers. I'm on a computer. morning. Hello, Elaine. And well, I think we can begin. It's 11 o'clock. Uh, welcome, everyone. We have uh, We'll have close to 60 computers, maybe close to 100 people uh, on this morning. And we welcome you all. It's really a blessing to ha have so many of you with us. Just a couple of uh, housekeeping matters. This, this uh, webinar is uh, recorded. It'll be available soon afterwards on the uh, Temple website. I also want to note that we have another one scheduled, another Lunch and Learn scheduled for April 20 with Mayor Brindle when we scheduled it. Uh, that's uh, Mayor Shelley Brindle, who is the uh, mayor of Westfield. When we scheduled it, uh, we didn't anticipate that we'd be in this position. Um, I'll be in touch with her. We might even want to move it up to an earlier date. We'll see what her schedule is like. She's obviously very busy now, uh, but we'll let you know. I want to thank Jackie Gruscott, our communications manager at the Temple for arranging and monitoring this uh, program. Uh, she's with us and if you have questions or comments, please enter them in the chat room 
And at the end of our uh, session, toward the end, uh, we'll try to stop about 15, 20 minutes before, uh, maybe even more. We'll have time for questions and Jackie will share those with us. So let's begin. I want to welcome my, my friend, uh, Father Anthony Randazzo, who's with us today. Uh, Father Randazzo is uh, the self-described happy pastor of uh, Holy Trinity Roman Catholic Church in Westfield, formerly uh, North Caldwell. Uh, he's my friend, he's a good friend of our new senior rabbi, uh, Ethan Prosnick. I know they're going to be working very closely together in the months and years ahead. So he and I are going to take just a few minutes at this opening to reflect on the pandemic crisis, and then we'll move on to our subject for today. Anthony, thank you for being with us. Good morning, uh, Rabbi. Good morning to everyone who is listening in. I am very honored to have been invited by dear Chuck, to uh, share in this dialogue. And before I begin, I'd like to quote a dear rabbi friend of mine who said this, a world without dialogue is a very sad world. Today, the rabbi and myself, by doing this dynamic, I hope will make the world a happier place. We have enough sadness. I hope everyone can smile as we go on through this dialogue and that will make the world a little bit of a happier place by this dialogue. Thank you again, Chuck, for this opportunity. Thank you, Anthony. It's particularly appropriate, I didn't plan it this way, particularly appropriate that this is an interfaith discussion because we are all in this together. I just wanna to say to um, those of you who are with us, and the numbers keep rising, um, how important all of you are to Terry and me. Terry's right next to me here. We've spoken to some of you. We wish we could speak with all of you. We want you to know that you're in our hearts and our prayers, and we know that uh, we are in yours. When I was at Hebrew Union College, I had a teacher of Hebrew prophets, Rabbi Sheldon Blank, and he said something then and wrote it later in his book that I think about every morning. He said, despair is a sin, hope is a duty. I'll repeat that. Despair is a sin and hope is a duty. So every morning I get up and I uh, say to myself, hope is a duty today. And if I should forget it, Terry's right here to remind me. I also think of Reb uh, Nachman of Bratzloff, who said in different circumstances, uh, it is a mitzvah to go about each day joyfully. So we're trying to find joyful things each day. Uh, I'm tremendously appreciative of the dedication of our healthcare professionals and scientists. I've always had enormous respect for them. Now it's off the charts. And I'm overwhelmed by the acts of generosity uh, of members of our congregation and of the um, strength of our temple leadership, our clergy team, our president and the board, our volunteers, neighbors and friends, you're amazing. And finally, um, I'm trying to look at this as an opportunity to declutter the house, to reach out to friends and family who haven't spoken in a while. And I'm amazed at changes. Um, I just want to conclude my brief comment with um, a little anecdote that our student rabbi Becky J shared with us at Simchat Shabbat this past Shabbat morning. Uh, she said that there's a, there's a rabbi in uh, West London who had been trying to get a minion for his uh, morning shachari service day after day and he had such great difficulty. And then he went online, he couldn't get 10, 10 people. And then of necessity went online and within days, there were 2000 people at his Shacharit minion. So these are the opportunities. 
Okay. Um, I'd like to, uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to, we're going to dialogue together. Um, I'm going to ask my friend Anthony uh, a few questions for him to reflect on. Uh, then he'll toss a few to me and then we'll open up to hear from all of you. Uh, Anthony, particularly for this time, uh, what are the values that are most important to you at this time in our society? Chuck, that's a, a great question. And as I look to the wisdom of people in the past, I've been listening to the wisdom of Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. Great. And at this time, I would say that the values that stand out and as you mentioned, hope as a duty, surrounding that hope, the value of compassion, that as we listen to people, our government leadership, our medical leadership, we must listen compassionately. Competency and compassion go together. So I would say that during these times, in this pandemic, from a global point of view, where the sciences are connecting deeply about the origins and the treatment and the vaccine and all the issues on public health, that we as a world community are learning some of the greater facets of meaning and purpose through competent scientific collaboration and through the means of compassionate care. Also, I see at this time, another value that comes to the forefront is the value that people do put on spirituality as a whole, general spirituality. That is to say, we have all in our denominations have heard the terms uh, spiritual, but not religious. And we've heard the terms in Catholicism uh, done, done in the sense of people being done with church. It seems to me at this time that we're going to have a resurgence of people looking at the healthier aspects of religious identity as it comes through their spirituality. This is the time and place where spirituality leads the way into a rediscovered religious identity. Those are just some of the thoughts that I'm having as uh, we listen daily to reports and uh, giving not only the facts, but the hope that as we respond, and that's what Viktor Frankl was keen on, how you respond to the circumstances. The circumstances are what they are. It's how you respond to them and give them meaning and purpose. Anthony, uh, just staying with that for a moment, I, I, I love the fact that you mentioned uh, uh, my old friend, Viktor Frankl. I didn't know him personally, but uh, oh. uh, studied him a lot. Uh, for those listening, I just, if you want to Google uh, him later, um, it's spelled F-R-A-N-K-L. A little bit unusual. There's no E in there, as I recall. Right, Anthony? Uh, yes, that's Victor, correct. That's Victor, correct. No E. No E. Victor, F-R-A-N-K-L. I've, I've found great meaning in Frankel over the years. Do you want to just share a, a couple more words about um, what Frankel was teaching us? You, you uh, finding meaning in, in, in every day, and, and uh, if you want to just expand on that a little bit. It's, it's you know so what, Chuck? Uh, I, I was just looking at some quotes. What, what I think uh, Frankel in the concentration camp was mm -hmm. dealing with was that there was a lot of despair around him. And there was a lot of uncertainty. There was the threat of death all the time. But he was, uh, I think, lifting himself up by, by having something of a creative purpose each day. So what I think is at the core of Frankel is something that always comes through crisis. That is creativity. And creativity spiritually, uh, you know, once again, meaning and purpose or the lifeline to survival, because he was looking to survive, but he wasn't just looking to survive on his own. He wanted the community to survive with him. And that to me is the most distinguishable point of why we go to a person of that wisdom. This is not just about self survival, 
This is about wanting everyone, every human to survive together. Uh, that's so appropriate and, and, and so significant today. And you, and you, you shared it beautifully, Anthony. Uh, uh, you and I have talked a, a number of times now. Uh, I didn't know that you were a, uh, uh, a fan of Viktor Frankl, I, but I, I'm, not, I'm not surprised. Um, and uh, we also share, a, I think, a love for Martin Buber as well. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. So let's, uh, let's shift a little bit. Um, on a, on, a, on a lot of our minds is, uh, is Pope Francis. Um, and you and I have talked about, about him. Uh, what, uh, what, do you, what do you like about Pope Francis? Um, share with us some of your thoughts about uh, the leader of the Roman Catholic world. Well, thank you, Chuck, for that question. I, I do not only like Pope Francis, I love the person and I love the kind of leadership that Pope Francis has provided for the last seven years. It was this month, seven years ago, on March 13th, that uh, Pope Francis became the Bishop of Rome. That is to say the Supreme Pontiff of the Roman Catholic Church. But if I were to uh, look at Francis from three directions, the first direction is that Francis is a grassroots kind of a person that he's uh, someone who came out of a life situation in Argentina that really enabled him to be elbow to elbow with people. He is a person who is about the practical language of faith. He is not into abstract thinking. He often criticizes religious ideologies. He's a man who wants to make sure the poor are fed he wants to make sure the ill are visited. He wants to live by what we call in the uh, New Testament language, the Beatitudes. He wants to make sure that uh, the pure of heart are being fulfilled as they graciously take care of other people and serve other people. He's a man of Matthew 25, which in the Gospels is, uh, is centered in the Jewish understanding of mitzvah of service, Matthew 25. So I like this Pope because of his centrality in the hands-on approach to humankind. Secondly, the uh, personal trait I love about the man is he's humble. He's a humble leader. He's a man that's asked for forgiveness uh, when he has made a mistake. He has not approached this leadership role from the point of uh, some type of aloofness, but he's grounded, he's a grounded man. He has humble actions. He, he washes the feet of the people. He is not in any way highfalutin, but he is someone who wants to be the humble servant. And lastly, uh, this is a Pope that because of a rabbi, I feel I know even better, and that is Rabbi Abraham Skorka. I have never been able to say that I know a good friend of a Pope, mm -hmm. and that good friend happens to be Rabbi Skorka. So I'm of the firm belief that when you know other people's friends, you know them. So uh, indirectly, I'd like to call Pope Francis a friend by virtue of a friendship with Rabbi Abraham Skorka, who is presently at uh, the University of St. Joseph's in Philadelphia, and who wrote this book, by the way, I just want to bring this to everyone's attention, Pope Francis on Faith, Family, and the Church in the 21st century. Hold it, hold it a little higher. 21st a little century. higher. There you go. And there you'll see the rabbi's name uh, on the bottom of it. You'll see the picture of, of Skorka and the rabbi together. I hope you can see that picture of the two of them side by side. But I uh, absolutely admire their friendship and all that they've done together. That's my little take on Pope Francis. That's great, thank you for sharing that. Anthony, just tech, a technical, uh, if you could either adjust your computer or, or move a little closer so we can see your full face. Okay. Uh, that's, that's better, oh, much better. Okay. Great, great. So continue, uh, and I wanna remind those uh, on, the, um, on the call that, uh, Questions and comments you can put in the chat room and we'll be addressing them 
later. Uh, following up on that, Anthony, uh, what had you hoped for in his pontificate that has not been realized? That's a great question, Chuck. I mean, I, one of the great commentators on this uh, pontificate is a journalist by the name of John Allen. John Allen just gave a presentation, a very, I would say, objective presentation on the Pope's successes and failures out in California last month. And I would agree with him that there are certain things that are incomplete about what this Pope has tried to do in these seven years. He certainly has addressed directly the clerical sexual abuse issue, but more is, needs to be done. Uh, there was a lot of disappointment. He's had failures and success in that regard. He's also tried to uh, rearrange uh, Vatican finances and uh, look at how uh, the Vatican goes about its work. And the reform of the Curia, as we know historically, has never been easy in church history. Uh, the Pope, as John Allen has said, has had success and failure in that regard. Uh, I would say there are three things personally that I'm still a, a little bit disappointed, and I guess considering pandemic times, maybe these three personal considerations are certainly not at the top of his agenda these days. But before this pandemic, I was disappointed that he did not take the opportunity with the, a meeting that he had uh, from representatives, bishops from the Amazon to basically open up to optional celibacy. I, I still think that you can have a healthy celibate priesthood and at the same time, you can have a healthy married priesthood and that we really need to have the symbiosis of both experiences of ministerial priesthood. So I'm disappointed that we're still not there yet. And uh, I don't know where that is now on the agenda. Secondly, he had the opportunity to really include women in ordained ministry as female deacons who would take upon a, a charge in the church that would put them in, uh, in the church's hierarchy, uh, deacon, priest, bishop. And I'm disappointed that he has not yet acted on that. I, I am so deeply for the inclusion of women in ordained ministry, particularly in the diaconate. I've promoted it for years. 80% uh, of the ministry of church is performed by the gifts of women. And uh, I just hope and pray that maybe one day, like I said, I don't know where this is on the agenda, there was a full study and that study uh, was pretty conclusive on the history and the precedent for women's diaconate in the Roman Catholic Church, or at least in the Christian Church, uh, that, and it still has not happened. And lastly, my hope is uh, in the future, and maybe uh, this is something that uh, in light of the pandemic, that we will, we will, in our leadership and how we decide on leadership in the Roman Catholic Church, that this will be more uh, open to the entire community. I, in the sense of having representatives vote on leaders, uh, having a, a wider means of having the whole community decide their leadership. I think the Roman Catholic Church needs to do some reform in how it goes about the selection of its leaders. My point is, is if you can elect the Bishop of Rome, as do the Cardinals, you can elect the local bishop. And uh, I know that that is perhaps in many people's minds controversial, but I guess in a democratic society, we feel very strongly about electing. <coughs> Relating then to that last point, uh, you're referring to the, an increased role in lay people. Uh, I, my, my promotion of the, you know, with the Second Vatican Council, uh, men and women by virtue of their baptism uh, should indeed be gifted and called, as we say in one of our documents, gifted and called to all ministries. And I would love to see greater mission of election that in the, the gift in this, the community does have the capacity to, uh, to bring forth the leadership they feel 
should lead the church forward. So I'm a, a big uh, proponent of a different form of how we select our leadership. So I'm going to follow up with just a one question on this that may put you on the spot and uh, you don't have to answer if you don't want to. Um, you just advocated for uh, women very strongly and beautifully um, in the, uh, particularly in the deaconate as deacons. Um, would you as a parish priest be in favor of women priests? I must say personally, I have been in favor of women in the priesthood for the last 35 years. And the reason for that is because of the critical study that began in my life at the American College of Louvain in Belgium, where we began to look at the sources critically in dialogue with the experience of humankind. Uh, theology is the combination of the written sources and the experiences of humankind. Thus, in respect to the equality of women, for me, the inclusion of women in the ordained ministry of, of priesthood is indeed a major acceptance that God created them, as does our Hebrew scriptures say, male and female in the image and likeness of God. For me, the argument ended with the first book of Genesis. That is the doorway into inclusion. Once we begin with that as a starting point, then we go forward. At the same time, as someone who is uh, truly part of the institutional church, I accept the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church at this time, but would always be willing to enter the dialogue from a scholarly point of view, and that that dialogue would in some way move to a decision that would protect, truly, because I think this decision would also protect women globally and help all people to understand the dignity of the feminine in the world today. Amen. Amen. Uh, Hebrew Union College ordained its first female rabbi in 1972. Uh, other, many other institutions followed. Uh, it's had a transformative and magnificent impact on Reform Judaism and, and in Judaism in general. And happily, a, a, a number of women from our congregation uh, have become uh, distinguished rabbis uh, in America today. I salute all the women, the, uh, all the lay professional women that I've collaborated with over these 35 years. I salute them, admire them, and would love to see them in great leadership positions. Beautiful, thank you for that. <clears throat> we are, uh, have at least one ch chance for one more time, one more question, this direction. Um, Anti-Semitism is um, a crucial concern for Jews. I, I just have to add, and I guess it should be no surprise, that there are dark places around the world that are blaming Jews today for the coronavirus, um, as you've probably heard. Um, what's your take on the uh, depth of anti-Semitism in our society? Um, well, first of all, Chuck, it breaks my heart that in our times that that blame even in light of this, uh, would be put upon the beautiful people of Jewish faith. I, I just find it incomprehensible. For me personally, uh, once again, uh, Judaism is at the core of being Christian uh, in the understanding of the Jewish Jesus and the understanding that you cannot read uh, the New Testament without the Hebrew scriptures. So uh, not a, the the whole issue of not regarding another human being, irrespective of their faith and uh, degrading a human being because of their faith, that in my heart and mind is incomprehensible. So for me to, uh, to be a pro 
the Hebrew person, to be pro the Hebrew scriptures, to be pro the practice of Jewish faith, to be pro uh, the visitation of Israel and the Holy Land. To me, the way you you end anti-Semitism is you do everything pro-Jewish that is healthy, that is community building, that is uh, essential to seeing all the values that the Jewish people have indeed contributed to uh, humanity. So uh, once again, in any anti-Semitism that I see or, or the marks of that kind of uh, slander upon the Jewish people uh, personally is hurtful. And the only the way I hope to be for people of the Jewish faith is dialogues like this, friendships, collaboration, community building. Uh, I, I just, like you say in the question, it's a poison. And I think the only way you deal with poison is basically with a healing salve, a balm of love and courtesy and gentleness. And uh, you mentioned your wonderful new rabbi, Ethan. I, I cannot say enough about uh, the young rabbi and how impressed I am and the form of leadership that I know he will provide for your beloved community. Uh, so my thing on anti-Semitism is uh, the more friendship we create, the more knowledge we share, the more we come to a deeper sensitivity of the human person. That is the end of anti-Semitism or anti-any person. Beautifully said, Anthony. Um, just a quick follow-up on that. Um, in your, looking back over the last couple of decades, from your perch, uh, do, you, do you sense anti-Semitism um, has increased, decreased, or more or less stayed the same? Do you have any sense, just from your own personal experience? You know, I, I guess because I am so fond of the Jewish people, uh, when I read about anti-Semitism in the newspaper or reported, um, I, I just, once again, it, emotionally, I, I can't handle the anti-Semitism. So I, I try to neutralize that in my own mind. Uh, so when it comes to uh, the, whether or not it's rising or falling, it, you know, many people would say it has risen over these years. Uh, for me, what I'm always trying to do is promote that which creates the unity and never, ever the hatred of another. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think maybe we'll, uh, we'll do a little, right now, one, one more quick one, one more quick one. Um, I want to end this particular section on a high note, and that is, what do you take special pride in? at Holy Trinity? And what are your, your fondest hopes after we get through this and while we're getting through it uh, for your parish? Well, I, I take great pride in the great staff. I'm, I'm surrounded with uh, wonderful uh, deacons, married deacons and their wives. One dear one, Barbara had passed away. Keith, Dick and Keith and his dear wife, Terry. And all the lay staff that we have here, the lay professional ministers, I, I'm so blessed. I'm blessed by a community that wants to participate. They want to get involved. Uh, I, I find that as we continue, I've only been the pastor here three years, I've been here five years. And as we continue to collaborate, coordinate with one another, good things can happen. We're coming near to our 150th anniversary of this community. Uh, so my hope is, is that our young people, I, I honestly feel it, I'm intergener intergenerational. I want to see intergenerational uh, happening constantly, that we can do things with all ages, that we spark the dialogue, the mentoring. Uh, our dear youth minister is doing a lot with mentoring right now with our people, our elders, and our young people. I am so for the interconnectedness. The stronger you build community, the stronger you're able to help people build community outside this community to others. I want to build community builders. I want to build contemplative people, people that know how to pray 
through a crisis, people that are compassionate. And as they encounter the vulnerable and the fragile, they will change and grow. And so I, I, there's many hopes and dreams that as we continue to work together, I, I find the best kind of ministry is collaborative ministry. So together, my hopes, I hopes will be, will be the hopes of the community for going forward, but also in an interfaith perspective. Uh, no faith-based community should ever walk the journey alone. <laughs> we need to be connecting with one another and interdependent on one another and coming out with statements together. Uh, I'm all for the wonder and the awe of the ecumenical movement uh, because I feel that that truly is in awe of the same God. Uh, beautiful. I'm, um, I'm looking forward to the... Uh, uh, relationship that, that you and uh, Rabbi Prasna and Ethan have, uh, I, I see that in our community becoming an extraordinary model for interfaith leadership uh, at all levels. Uh, and uh, Thank you. And I, I look forward to that too very much. As you know, my dear friend, Alan Silverstein in Caldwell, we had that relationship and it did indeed uh, work wonders for the community. Yes. Oh, you did. And um, I know that that relationship uh, with Ethan is uh, evolving very, very quickly in that direction. It's beautiful. Thank you. Learning for all of us. Uh, your, your responses have been um, inspiring and uh, helpful to me. I, I know to others as well. I want to remind folks that uh, in the Q&A or in the chat, you can um, share comments or questions, and we're going to get to them in just a short while. Your turn, Anthony. Okay, Chuck. Uh, first of all, thank you for composing those uh, very pertinent questions. I hope I helped the community to understand yeah, better uh, some perspectives. But my questions, and we had discussed this, what is the significance of marriage in Judaism, and how do you view intermarriage? And uh, nowadays, considering the present where we can't have any marriages uh, as we look into the future when we when we finally get back together again tell me about the significance of marriage in Judaism and your view of intermarriage sure incidentally a few of my colleagues have officiated at a virtual marriage uh oh they have yes okay. they have I'm not sure what the legality of it is but I assume it'll hold it'll hold <laughs> it'll, it'll hold right and whatever needs to get signed will get signed uh, yeah, marriage is really at the heart, marriage and family are very much at the heart of, of, of Judaism and the Jewish people. Um, as you know, the opening chapters of, of Genesis, uh, it is not good for man or woman to be separate. Uh, we're, I'll, uh, gender equality, I'll update it that we are Ezra Kinegdo, we are help meets to each other. Mm. Um, so uh, the term mishpacha, uh, sometimes spoken as mishpacha, uh, family is almost a holy word uh, in Judaism. So much of, of what we do is family connected. In saying that, I want to emphasize that, um, especially in, in the last half century, uh, the importance of the individual, because not everyone is married, the uh, importance of the individual in Judaism has risen. Mm. And um, we have needed to find uh, new ways to integrate, to welcome, and to recognize the um, equal significance mm. of, of individual. I think, it, I think it's fair to say that 100, 150 years ago, um, a, a single person who had not been married um, in, in Jewish uh, society um, was, did, was, did not receive the full reception and, and, and welcome. Yeah. Wow. Um, and that had to change, yes. and, and it is changing uh, significantly. Um, marriage also symbolizes uh, the relationship of God and Israel. Mm. Uh, God and the, and the Jewish people, uh, spoken of as a 
Brit as a covenant. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and, and that's the concept in, of marriage in Judaism as well. So it's at the heart of, of who we are, but it's not the only way to live a, a full Jewish life. Um, as for intermarriage, intermarriage is a challenge for Jews and it is an opportunity at the same time. Historically, there has been uh, strong opposition to intermarriage uh, and to rabbis officiating at intermarriage. That's, that's changed significantly, especially in North America, or especially in the United States. Um, today, 60 to 80 percent of all the marriages involving Jews are intermarriages. Um, that's, that's very, very high. It varies between Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform, but Conservative and non-Orthodox is particularly high. So that's a reality that uh, is not going to change. Uh, one could say it's a price you pay for living in a, an open, free society where you work and socialize and, and, and live and dialogue with... Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, on the other hand, it is an opportunity. Yes. Um, there are... Um, there are so many, so the opportunity side, there's so many wonderful human beings who have studied Judaism and have become Jews by choice. And our, our movement has been enriched by it. Uh, I, 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 there was a, um, a gathering, I'm not going to be specific, but there was a family gathering uh, some weeks ago. Um, uh, of a family in our congregation, where uh, the uh, all of the children and their spouses were were, were pretty are pretty well educated in Jewish life, but the one who stood out in figuring out how to handle uh, being Jewish in this in that particular setting was the Jew by choice, a woman who had married into the family, and we see that again and again and again. So the opportunity has has been that uh, Jews of choice and also uh, Jews of choice have, um, have enriched and strengthened our people. And yes. there, are, there are many non-Jews in married to Jews who may not have converted, but who are also um, strongly involved in Jewish life yes. and in the synagogue. So it is a, an evolving uh, issue. Um, uh, and again, a challenge and an opportunity. You know, it's interesting you say that, Chuck. A very dear friend of mine uh, married a wonderful Jewish woman. And that intercultural expression, he's of Polish descent and uh, his dear wife from Jewish faith. I mean, they, they have intertwined the Catholic and Jewish traditions beautifully. And I see them as a, a great sign of, of how on that level love grows in a beautiful way by the encounter of our traditions that are our mutual faith we have customs we have traditions and whether it be easter or passover or passover table how we can somehow be mutually enriching in our traditions uh, maintaining identities and sharing traditions which, uh, how about, Chuck, in light of uh, now the same-sex marriage issue, how is the Reformed community addressing same-sex marriage and whether or not uh, the rabbi is able to preside at that form of marriage? Uh, that, yeah, good question, Anthony. Um, that, that issue and that challenge was addressed by the Central Conference of American Rabbis, the Re our international reform movement, um, about 25 years ago. Okay. And I had the honor of being part of that, that group that addressed it. And um, after uh, uh, a year or so of deliberations and discussion, it became so clear to us 
uh, how significant it is to embrace uh, the totality of, uh, of our people, irrespective of their sexual orientation. So I, I think we can say today that there is very broad acceptance. We have a significant number of students at the Hebrew Union College and ordained rabbis over the past years who um, are uh, LGBTQ. Okay. And, uh, and many of them, of course, are in same-sex relationships. Uh, it's, um, it's broadly accepted, uh, and, and that, that acceptance and, and respect for those relationships, uh, I think, continues to grow every day. I, I, um, I, I don't think it's, it's, a, it's a significant issue today. Maybe some who are listening uh, may want to uh, share their thoughts on that uh, in a little while. Thank you. Thank you. And I, sh and I should say, again, as with women from the 70s, um, uh, our rabbis and, and leaders uh, of that orientation, sexual orientation, uh, have just enriched our, our movement tremendously and, and bring enormous gifts. Thank you. Thank you. I like, Chuck, your use of the term movement. Uh, any good movement is uh, certainly uh, empowered in different ways. So uh, may all beautiful movements continue. I'd like to ask this question, Chuck, and uh, this has all to do with uh, rabbinical spirituality. How do you and your fellow rabbis cultivate that spirituality with self-care, your own mental health, and particularly now, what are rabbis doing to support one another during this uh, pandemic? Um, yeah. You know, what is the role of the rabbi's spouse? Um, this is certainly not the question that we ask in Catholicism because there is no spouse here. But what is the profile of the contemporary rabbinical life? I mean, I'm fascinated by it. With my buddy, Rabbi Skorka, I've met his wife and I've been with them socially. So uh, I, I really enjoy seeing the interplay of rabbi and spouse. It's a wonderful question, particularly appropriate today. Um, I've, I've taught rabbinic students uh, self-care and the, the uh, The analogy that I use is the instructions you receive in, in an airplane. Uh, if there's a shortage of if oxygen is lost and the, the masks drop, take care of yourself first so that, that you're then able to help others. Um, rabbis must engage in self-care. I think it's harder today. The opportunities and resources are greater today. There's no question about that. The resources are greater, the sensitivity is greater, and the challenge for rabbis to take care of themselves um, is also greater. <clears throat> now, I want to use a, uh, an analogy, another analogy. Uh, when I became a rabbi, uh, it was a little bit like one size fits all, or two or three sizes fit all. <clears throat> and I compare it to the media world. Uh, when I was growing up, and um, this applies to some people who are listening, uh, there were three television networks, right? ABC, NBC, and CBS. And that was pretty much it. And we all got our news from um, uh, Walter Cronkite and uh, Huntley and Brinkley. Yes, I remember that. Right? Yes, yes, I remember that. Old enough to remember that. Yes. What a, those, that's called broadcasting. Now we have what's called narrowcasting. We have, we have television channels for men and women ages 60 to 66 who are playing golf. And then there's another one for 66 to 73. <laughs> you get my point. Um, yes. Um, the challenge is today because we are narrow casting. There are many more subgroups. I know where you find that in the parish as well. Yes. And so the expectations are, are greater. 300 people would show up for a sermon and we preach and we get the message out. 
Now we have to do that 12 or 14 different times because <laughs> it's smaller groups. Now yes. that's, yes. that's not all bad. Yes. No, I mean, that's, that, there's a lot of goodness in that because uh, it means that it can be focused and directed to, to families and individuals and so forth. Um, but the challenges are, are enormous. There are, there are spirituality groups. Um, one of the rabbis who grew up in our congregation, the Rabbi Ellen Lewis leads uh, one of those. Um, I was on one last week led by um, a dear friend and rabbi. Um, we have a lot of resources and our, our uh, rabbis have taken advantage of that. Very important, especially if, if um, uh, some of the leaders of our synagogue are listening right now, and I think they are. Um, it's very important, uh, for example, as, as Rabbi Prosnit and, and others take, take on leadership for, for them to make sure that our clergy, uh, rabbis, cantors, and, and others, um, uh, take time for themselves. Yes. Uh, and um, uh, of course, I, you mentioned spouses. We're, I'm grateful that uh, Terry is sitting right next to me uh, is here. She's my number one spiritual resource. Amen. Amen to that. Yeah. Amen. So here we are. Uh, this has been wonderful. I'm cognizant of the time, and I'm going to turn to our good friend Jackie Gruscott uh, to share any questions or comments that have come to us during this time. And those of you who are listening, please feel free uh, to include others as, as we're moving along here. We, we really want to hear from you. Jackie? All right, so we have our first question and it's for Father Randazzo. So the question is, can you be a Catholic and not believe in God? Uh, you know what, I, I don't think that's possible because for Catholicism, it's very much grounded in the Trinity, uh, the expression of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we are in, in many ways, a, a, an experience of the divine based faith. So a belief in God, in fact, we say that in our creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. So I don't think that that could happen in Catholicism where someone would dismiss their belief in God and still want to claim Catholic identity. Thank you. Uh, Rabbi Kralak, we have a similar question for you. Can you be Jewish and not believe in God? Yes, I think you can. Uh, there are so many, Ju Judaism was born as a religion, but then became a people and a culture. And so there are multiple ways that you can express your Judaism today. For example, there are many people living in Israel who are Jews, who are Zionists by virtue of their being citizens of Israel, who do not believe in God, but who engage in Jewish culture, uh, who defend the Jewish state, who enrich the Jewish people. Um, I would never want to say that they're not Jews or good Jews. They are, they're good Jews. And there is no, there's no faith test for being a Jew. I mean, it's pretty basic. It's, um, if you're born of a Jewish mother, according to the halakha, to Jewish law, you are, you are Jewish. And now of course, uh, in reform Judaism, if either of your parents is Jewish, you are, you are Jewish. So yes, there are so many <laughs> different ways uh, culturally um, and, and religiously and spiritually to express Judaism without necessarily believing in God. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Uh, Father, this next one is for you. Um, how is your program of healing dialogue progressing? Are you on, Anthony? Can you hear us? I think we may have lost oh, him. I think he's frozen. Ooh. Oh, 
Yep, he is frozen. Um, well, in the meantime, uh, Rabbi, we, we have one question that you can take on. Um, what more can you and all members of ministry and community do to address anti-Semitism locally? That's a really good question. Uh, and before I address that, uh, Jackie, I, is there any way that you can help bring? Yep, yep. I'm going to send him another email to try to get him back on. Oh, oh great. Okay. Meanwhile, I will, I will try to address that question uh, locally. Um, so I, I think there are a number of ways. Uh, one is what Anthony and, and I just spoke about, and that is building close relationships with the clergy of, of the of various um, religious institutions. And, and uh, I think in, in our day and age, this should be a high priority for our synagogue. I know it is for Rabbi Prosnit, um, and, and will be going forward. And I think it's something that our, our lay leadership uh, should, should uh, emphasize and, um, and encourage in every way possible. <laughs> Um, here's, a, here's a good example of it in our history. Some of you know that um, we have this close relationship with St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Plainfield. It was uh, built uh, many years ago by our uh, uh, social justice uh, team and, and, and committee, um, and we've uh, shared in um, working with the homeless. Um, these social justice projects and rehabilitating housing and putting on uh, cultural programs. We, we staged plays together. Um, those were uh, those were wonderful relationships. They're still, still going on. Um, second thing is, uh, again, reaching back to successful programs in the past. And I think I think there would be real opening for this today. Is building creating some small groups. Of lay and uh, of lay people of, of people who are on this call, um, say from our synagogue and another church. Welcome back, Anthony. Yeah, sorry, got disconnected somehow. Right. The question. The question um, was how can um, we build uh, address anti-Semitism locally? And I I talked about uh, again the relationship of the clergy, not just you and and, and Ethan, but um, all of the clergy in Westfield, and there's a wonderful group of clergy here now. It's a little bit in transition, but it's 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 a terrific group that's open to that. And then, Anthony, what do you what do you think about creating broad, small groups of oh, people to, to meet uh, the temple in a church or the temple in three churches uh, to discuss matters of our own concern of, of common concern, spiritual matters, social, and also sharing in social justice project, some of which is being done and we have done. Thoughts on that? Yeah, no, Chuck, I'm all for small faith sharing groups. In fact, in Catholicism, we have something called Renew International, which is based in that kind of small group interaction. We have uh, a coordinator of small faith sharing groups here in the parish. And uh, I know that Kathy Skrupkis, who is in charge of faith formation for adults, would certainly be behind an initiative for uh, small faith sharing groups. There's no better way when we get back to normalcy, or uh, if not through in person, but through Zoom, I think we could do something like that. Uh, and, I, and I agree, the clergy here in West are exceptional to the point that you may or may not know the, the neighboring Catholic pastor, Father Michael Saparito, was nominated to be a bishop. So he was the pastor of St. Helens. So uh, yes, the clergy, the young clergy, all the people working, the new Methodist minister coming in at First Methodist and uh, Reverend Jeremy at the uh, Presbyterian Church and uh, Joy leading the way at the Congregational Church, all exceptional. Uh, uh, Myrna at the First Baptist, we have exceptional clergy, yes. We, we do, and, and I, uh, I think this is a, uh, a moment in time it's clearly a moment in time uh, for, for that to happen. I just saw Jackie Rose's name pop up on chat. You know, Jackie's been somebody who's, who's kept these, this interfaith work moving along beautifully. 
um, for us over a long period of time. And there's so many others as well on, on and I spoke of the St. Mark's Episcopal Church. Yeah, good. Uh, Jackie Gruscott. Uh, I, I want to comment incidentally that um, we, we have almost 80 computers that have been on here. We probably have 120, 130 people uh, on today, which is, uh, we don't have enough tuna fish. I'm sorry for you all, you're gonna have to get your own. Uh, Jackie? Great, um, so this is an interesting question and um, we'll, we'll send it out to both of you. So how do you feel interfaith couples should be celebrating each other's religion? Great question. <laughs> Anthony, I'd love for you to go first. You know, I, I can only go to this uh, very dear friend, Tony and Randy. Uh, through the years, I mean, they have shared, uh, they have taken their children both to synagogue and to church. They have introduced their children to the prayers of both Jewish faith and Christian faith. They have symbols of Christianity and Judaism in their home. Uh, they are always, uh, I always, in fact, they've become advisors to me when I have interfaith couples. I always uh, reach out to them for some insight. So as far as I'm concerned, it can be extremely workable. It depends upon one word and maturity. I think any time uh, we come into anything with any differences of any kind, what really begins to happen is based upon mutuality and maturity. Thus, uh, in when those two things are in place, anything is possible. Okay. So I assume the question uh, refers to a couple that is, ma is maintaining its own respective faith. We're not talking about where one is converted to the other. So with that assumption, uh, again, I think that there's essential that there be respect for each other's faiths. Uh, and um, if, if the couple is blessed with children, um, I feel strongly that the children need to be raised in um, one faith, not in both faiths. Now, that doesn't, let, let's take a, a child who's raised in the Jewish faith, in, in an interfaith family. Uh, that child, it's important for let's call it a, a, a him, to know the, um, and let's assume the mother's not Jewish, just for purposes of this example. It's, it's important for, for that young boy to know about his mother's, let's say, Catholicism, um, and, and to know why it's important, and to know something about the symbols and the traditions and the faith, absolutely. And to meet Father Randazzo. Shadow, <laughs> Shadow. That Anthony is, is uh, his mother's uh, priest. Yeah, that's right. Um, but at the same time, the child uh, would hopefully know that he is Jewish, uh, being raised as a Jew, uh, and um, uh, knows about both religions, but is living the Jewish life. Um, if it goes the other way, and the child is being raised as a, a Christian, the same thing would apply. Um, yes. Yeah. Now, we in Judaism have a very special kind of situation. Our birth rate is um, very low. U.S. birth rate, I read the other day, I think is dropped to the lowest since 1919. Don't hold me to that, but it's, it's early part of the 20th century. Um, we are below, the, the replacement rate is 2.1. Uh, we used to be 1.9 yes. children. Uh, I don't know what that 0. 0.9 child looks like, but you know what I mean. Uh, it's now below 1.9. Uh, post Holocaust, um, we are a small people, and um, repopulating the Jewish people and strengthening is very, very uh, important. Uh, so I, I have to throw that yes. that in. Yes, I agree. I agree with everything you've said, Chuck, absolutely, for the survivability of the Jewish people, absolutely, yes. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Jackie. See, we have a number of, number of comments and questions, please. Yes, they're coming in. Uh, so, Rabbi, this one is for you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about 
really what, what Judaism is. Is it a religion? Is it a nationality? Can you help us get a little bit more educated on, on what this is all about? Do you have about five hours or 25 <laughs> hours? <laughs> That's a tough one. I mean, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a tough question. It's, it's, it's hard to, to do it in uh, a couple of minutes. Um, and it, maybe we'll do it as, a, as another uh, webinar, another Lunch and Learn. Um, I think at, at the core, for me, at the core for me, Judaism is a religion, God-centered, uh, Torah-centered, uh, centered also on the Hebrew prophets and their command to us to do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God as from Micah 6.8 on the front of our building which hundreds of thousands of commuters have memorized over the years. Uh, I think that's the core. Without that core, I do not think we would survive. It would take a time for, a time for us to go down, but we would not survive without that core. Given that core, it is then possible for those who have that faith and also for those who do not, to express their Judaism in, in other ways, as part, as I said before, as part of a people, through support for the state of Israel, through acts of social justice that are based on the prophetic and uh, Torah true um, commandments. Um, and there are other ex expressions <laughs> as well. I mean, Look, for, for some people, Judaism is art and music, uh, 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 is, is Jewish literature. And they, people go deep into that. Um, for some, it's the Jewish family, whatever, you know, whatever and however that means. And people go, do it, go deep into that. I would never say that you're less of a Jew because you're, you emphasize that and de-emphasize others. This is your your expression, this is who you are, and I'm thrilled that you're part of us, even if your emphasis is not, is not mine. Having said that, I do not believe that Judaism can survive as a pediatric religion, as a gastronomic religion, or as a religion of um, art, music, and literature. I don't even, I don't, and, I, and we can talk about whether we can survive as uh, a nation state on the Zionist level. That's a, a, a more complicated issue, but I, I think I've, I've shared. Uh, any, any, uh, I know it wasn't addressed to you, Anthony, but if you have any thoughts about that, I'd welcome it. Yeah. You know what, uh, Chuck, I, I think what you're saying is a very evolutionary understanding of uh, Jewish identity in life. And as time goes on, uh, I think that uh, the, the concept of the land in the sense that uh, Judaism's relationship with the land of Israel, the Holy Land, that that will be certainly uh, something identifiable into the future. That's uh, very, very important. I understand that very well. But I think that uh, we can only say so much on the future and how this will, uh, we're hoping, for uh, the great vibrancy in Jewish life, however that will be defined in the future. Vibrancy, I think, is uh, a fully alive experience for people in Judaism. To me, that's most important, that when it comes to religious identity, that it brings people some joy, it brings them hope, it brings them happiness, it brings them love, uh, that any religious identity is to be uh, deeply human and deeply fulfilling, deeply fulfilling. Yeah. Thank you for that. Now, just one final comment, and this is for a future discussion. Uh, we now have two centers of Jewish life in the world, two clear centers. One is Israel, and the other is North America. Uh, I don't know what the North American is going to look like when we 
get through this, but that, that's, and we will get through it. Um, the, the rest of, of, of the Jewish world is, is shrinking. And uh, it, it's, it's, this, it's this balance of these two centers that's worthy of, of considerable discussion and consideration as we, as we go forward. And if people are interested in, in talking about that, let, let us know either on the chat room or elsewhere, and we might, we might make it a subject for the coming uh, months. Yes. Jackie? Great. Uh, Father, this next question is for you. Uh, do you know many other priests who hold your theological opinions? <laughs> <laughs> one or two, Anthony, one or two. <laughs> you know what? I must honestly say that my own circle of brother priests, and uh, I would, there's probably about four or five that I'm sure hold some of these opinions. Uh, Monsignor Edward Cuba, Father Joe Massiello, who is here, uh, Rabbi Kroloff, knows uh, Monsignor Massiello, uh, a dear friend out in Florida, Father Owen, dear friend in Australia, a friend in Texas. Those are, those are fellow brothers. They're not only priests, they're, my, they're brothers to me. We, they may disagree with me on different things, but for the most part, we're all in the same ballpark on some of what I've shared with you. Yes, I haven't just cultivated some of these viewpoints on my own. It's been in collaboration with these brothers who taught me a great deal in their theological perspectives and through their ministerial experiences. But before we can, thank you, before we come to the next question, uh, I just had this thought to uh, our audience, our participants. Um, I'd love to know, I'd love to hear from you uh, personally uh, about what you think uh, about going forward with some of these um, dialogues and, and, and webinars, um, especially during the time when we are uh, self-isolated, self-quarantined. Uh, so feel free to email me directly. Uh, for those of you who don't have my email, I think most of you do. But if you don't have my email, it's rav, C-A-K, at AOL.com. I'll spell that. R-A-V is in Victor, C-A-K, at AOL.com. Again, R-A-V. C-A-K. Oh, there it is. Thank you very much, uh, Jackie. Uh, I'd love to hear your reaction to today, um, as well as suggestions for the future, and how often you think we ought to do this uh, kind of thing during this particular period of time. I, um, I don't have anywhere to go, so uh, uh, I could do it more frequently. I'd like to uh, bring Rabbi Prosnit into this process it's going forward as well. Uh, perhaps Rabbi Miller. Uh, so uh, feel free to uh, email me at ravcak at aol.com. Jackie, we have time for uh, one or two more, I think. Great. Um, so this next question says, what about town halls with local mayors and clergy on anti-Semitism to address this issue? Is that something that you would be open to? Yes, absolutely. I mean, once again, I think the, the dialogue, connecting with leadership, uh, civic leadership, religious leadership, it is, it is essential. And uh, I'm all for it. And I think the mayor here in Westfield, Mayor uh, Shelley, is the kind of person and her council, her town council, that would certainly be open to uh, town meetings of any kind the more we can discuss and collaborate, the more we can resolve and heal and move creatively into the future. Absolutely, I'm for it. That's something that we should certainly uh, pass on to uh, Rabbi President Jackie, uh, if I forget to, would you, you know, share that with him? You got uh, it. Absolutely, and I can't say enough about um, Mayor Shelley Brindle, who's um, quite an extraordinary leader. Becky? Okay, well, the first thing I want to say is just a comment um, to Father, and it says, I would like to thank Father Randazzo for his congregation's wonderful administration of the food pantry at Holy Trinity. We at Temple Emmanuel are so proud to be part of this social justice program. Well, I'm, I'm grateful to the leadership, Rose O'Hare, Deacon Tom Pluta, Deacon Keefe, all the volunteers that have put this interfaith ministry together 
when I first arrived here at Holy Trinity, the first place I went to was the food pantry to see how the, the poor were being fed. And it warms my heart during this pandemic. Uh, the collaboration is still going on. And my hope and prayer is, is that no one will ever go hungry because of the generosity of the people in Westfield, that we will provide for the hungry in the best way we can. It's a beautiful, beautiful program that Holy Trinity has had for many years. How, how, how long has it, has it been at Holy Trinity? Joe, Chuck, this, pre, this has gone on for years. Oh, I know. And the point was years. that we started it, but the, the point is to say that the, it's an interfaith pantry right. that's housed on our premises. So uh, people have been so kind and so generous, uh, particularly uh, all at Temple Emmanuel. So we are a grateful people. Together, we, we share this ministry. Yes. The fact that you house it there and have done so for so long is, is a great blessing. Jackie, I think we have time for, for one more quick one. Uh, and then and then it's wonderful that everybody stayed with us. Our participant level has remained very, very high the whole time. Thank you all for being with us. Uh, Jackie, one more. Okay, so this last question is for Father Randazzo. And it looks like someone who knows you very well. They said, are you still involved with the North Caldwell community as you were when you were with Notre Dame? And do you have any upcoming webinars such as the one you're doing with Rabbi Kroloff? Uh, Jackie, that's a lovely question. You know, I spent 18 years in North Caldwell. Thus, uh, all the community of Notre Dame and all that we did too with Temple Emmanuel, with the other communities, First Methodist Church, with uh, Jeff Markay, my dear friend, I have fond memories of many ways. We lived through 9-11 together in North Caldwell. So I have many deep connections in and through the beloved people of the Caldwells. At the same time here in uh, Westfield, I've been elated. I would love to do this more with anyone at any time, particularly during these times. I think it's helpful. I'm uh, very fond of communicating with people. I much prefer to do everything in person. Um, I'm a pretty, uh, social being. People know, know me that I'm, I'm a social being and uh, just communicating this way is, is great, but I, I love the presence of humankind, the physical presence in front of me in community, person to person. So I, I'm open to anything during this time that will be of service to people and that will keep everyone's spirits up so that we can have one great celebration when we can be not six feet from one another, but close to one another. Well, Anthony, you, you, you began our discussion with uh, reference to Viktor Frankl, the uh, uh, psychotherapist and philosopher, yep. uh, finding meaning in every day and every experience that he could. could. Uh, I think this has been a, a, a time, an hour of meaning. Uh, it has Thank been for you. me. I, I leave it um, uplifted. Uh, to be able to share with uh, a friend and colleagues such as yourself. And uh, I hope we can do it again. Um, I want to wish you and everybody at your parish a uh, happy Easter, one of peace and, and good health. And I want to wish everyone from our synagogue at Chag Sameach uh, a Wonderful Pesach, your virtual Sidarim, your virtual Seders, I hope will be uh, fulfilling for you. We plan a virtual Seder. Uh, thank you all for being with us. Thank you, Jackie, once again for your expertise. It's been a joy. And uh, watch for the next webinar. We hope it'll be soon. Everybody stay safe, be well, you and your families, you're in our prayers. Shalom to all, shalom. Thank you. And for those who want to join us later, at 3.30 today, we are having our interfaith prayer service. So if you haven't already signed up, I'm going to put the registration link for the webinar uh, in the chat box, and we hope to see you today at 3.30. Thank you, Jackie, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks.